greetings in the name of our risen Lord and Savior. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. As we begin our worship of our Lord together, let's focus our attention. And I'd like to share a portion of Psalm 19. The words of the Lord do really bring life. But they also bring his forgiveness when we fail to follow him. And we all do. It says, the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are sure, altogether righteous. They are more precious than gold than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the comb. By them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. And then he asks, who can discern his errors? Forgive my hidden faults, Lord. Keep your servant also from willful sins that may not rule over me. And then these final famous words, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. It's good to remember our, on this first day of Advent, as we begin that time of reflection and waiting for the coming of the Lord. As the prelude is played this morning, as we enjoy this time, I would direct your attention to the silent prayer. And may the Lord richly bless you as you worship him today. Amen.
Like a lonely night watchman, one candle holds up a flame that pierces through any darkness. Help us to keep watch for the dawn of your presence. One candle flame holds the promise that more light will be breaking through. Help us to keep our eyes peeled for your appearance as our great light revealer, O Lord. One candle burns and one holy Savior In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Look, He is coming with the clouds. Amen. And I will see Him, even those who pierced Him. All the nations will be gathered before Him. And He will separate people one from another, as a sheep separates the sheep from the goats. Lest that day surprise us unprepared, let us make confession of our sins imploring our Heavenly Father to have mercy on us for the sake of Jesus Christ. We'll take a moment of silence for personal reflection. Born among us, in fulfillment of God's promises, Jesus Christ ascended the mountain of the Lord to give his life as a ransom for all. Through faith and trust in Jesus, God the Father has reconciled you and me to himself by making peace through the blood of Jesus shed on the cross. He has forgiven us all of our sins. He canceled the written code with its regulations that accused us. He nailed this list of sins to the cross and left them there, setting us free from accusation. To see us through Jesus, without spot, without blemish. As a called and ordained servant of the word, I announce that you are forgiven in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O oh, come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. Amen. Since ancient days, the fields and floods, rocks, hills, and plains have been repeating the sounding joy of God's power. 
He stretched out his hand and divided the raging water of the Red Sea so the Israelites could safely escape from Egypt on dry ground. He made the way raised the plain. He stretched out his hand and the walls of Jericho came tumbling down and the Israelites triumphed. He reduced the high stone barrier to a pile of rubble. He led the shepherd David out of a deep and dark valley into a pleasant green pasture. He lifted David up from the valley and placed him on level ground. Now in these last days, the fields and floods, rocks, hills, and plains prepare for the coming Messiah. For he will calm the storming seas. The waters will be made placid, and the squalls will subside. Christ will come and seal the tossing torrents. For the mountain of his temple will be established as chief among the mountains. It will be raised above the hills, and all nations will stream to it. Christ will come and be lifted up to the highest mountain. For when the earth is ripe, he will take his sickle and reap, and the earth will be harvested. Christ will come and collect the faithful fruit of the year. As a shepherd looks after his scattered flock, so Christ will place us in a good, rich land where milk and honey flow, where cool waters soothe, and the fertile pastures flourish forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated for the reading of the lessons. Our first reading comes from Isaiah chapter 69, the Old Testament book of Isaiah. And in this reading, we have, you know, we've wandered from the Lord's ways like the ancient Israelites. But in the fullness of time, God rent the heavens and came down for our salvation in the person of Jesus Christ. This is what Isaiah writes. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains would tremble before you, as when fire sets twigs ablaze and causes water to boil. Come down to make your name known to your enemies and cause the nations to quake before you. For when you did awesome things that we did not expect, you came down, and the mountains trembled before you. Since ancient times, no one has heard no, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you who acts on behalf of those who wait for him. You come to the help of those who gladly do right, who remember your ways. But when we continued to sin against them, you were angry. How then can we be saved? All of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. We all shrivel up like a leaf, and like the wind, our, our sins sweep us away. No one calls on your name or strives to lay hold of you, for you have hidden your face from us and have given us over to our sins. Yet you, Lord, are our Father. We are the clay. You are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. Do not be angry beyond measure, Lord, do not remember our sins forever. Oh, look on us, we pray, for we are all your people. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second reading, the epistle reading, comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And we rejoice, Paul writes, in our relationship to God. He has called us, he has sanctified us, and he will sustain us. It reads like this. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank my God for you because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus. For in him you have been enriched in every way, with all kinds of speech and with all kinds of knowledge. God thus confirming our testimony about Christ among you. Therefore you do not lack any spiritual gift as you er eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. He will also keep you firm to the end, so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, who has called you into fellowship with his Son, 
Jesus Christ, our Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's rise for the reading of the gospel lesson. And this, uh, the first uh, Sunday in Advent, uh, the reading is from Mark chapter 11. It is the story of the entrance of Jesus into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. So you'll find it might a little bit interesting that it would be a verse that we're reading again in Advent. But the point of Advent is it's always pointing us to the coming of Jesus and the hope that he brings. And so as Jesus approached Jerusalem, there was tremendous hope about what he would bring. Mark chapter 11. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you. And just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord needs it and will send it back here shortly. They went and found a colt outside in the street, tied at a doorway. As they untied it, some people standing there asked, what are you doing untying the colt? They answered as Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches that they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated for the singing of the message hymn.
grace, mercy, and peace be multiplied unto you from our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Let us share the text that's printed for us this morning. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains would tremble before you. All of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. We all shrivel up like a leaf, and like the wind our sins sweep us away. How then can we be saved? Well, the season of Advent begins a new church year. Each year we will follow the liturgical church calendar, which is designed to take the church through the life of Jesus. It's a three-year lectionary cycle. One year is through the Gospel of Matthew, which we just completed. And then one year combines Mark and John, and then the third goes through the Gospel of Luke. The Advent season points us to the birth of Jesus and the message of John the Baptist, who is reminding us to prepare for his arrival. I like this Old Testament lesson this morning because he talked about the earthquake and how the earthquake would rend the heavens. Well, when Jesus rose from death, there was an earthquake and bodies sprang out of the grave that Easter morning. And when we get to the book of Revelation, there's talking about a great earthquake which will destroy the earth. Oh no, that great earthquake means all the dead who've ever died in Christ will rise to a glorified resurrected body. So that uh, Old Testament prophecy has something to do about even our future. But my problem this week is that this assigned text is again the Palm Sunday procession of Jesus into Jerusalem. We just covered Holy Week in my last five sermons. I thought you knew the story well enough. So that's why I've chosen this text from Isaiah. Advent is a season of anticipation, a time of hope. But for many people, hope is elusive. When Isaiah wrote his words, he was worried. Is there hope? How can we be saved? Even with Christmas on the horizon, just a few weeks away, people are pessimistic about the future. The continuing war in the Mideast, the chatter that is always there about being on the edge of World War III, means that fear is engulfing our planet. So fear controls the streets of New York and London and Tel Aviv, and people are worried about if their car is going to be hijacked this week. There's fear. Our borders have collapsed, and all we hear is in the news is preparation for 2024. Who's running and who's in and who's out? There is worry whether or not there is justice in our justice system. The financial business news, if you listen to that at all every morning, there are analysts who come on every single day, and they're still debating whether or not there's going to be a recession in 2024. They first thought it was in 2023, and now they've pushed it back. But they're still debating. The whole point is there's sort of this general hopelessness that's, re, that's facing our future. And so right now, there is this fear. And it's right on the heels of Thanksgiving, and we're entering into this season of Christmas, which is to be a, a season of hope. Our focus changes with preparation for Christmas. The moment families begin to decorate their homes, there is a sense of a hope that's renewed. And yet, we know that there's 14 or 18% inflation, and some families are now beginning to worry about how much they can put under the Christmas tree. Every day, we use this small magical word, hope. It's tough to live or even make it through a day without hope. I hope you feel better, Stan. <laughs> you know, I hope you feel better. I hope you have a healthy baby. I hope I get an A in that class. I hope she likes me. I hope to make a difference in the world someday. I hope the doctor gives you a good report. I hope, there, I hope I'll be able to buy a house. I hope to get that raise. I hope we have a world peace by Christmas that hope might be a little elusive. So what is hope? Hope is a vision for better days that changes the present. There is something good up ahead, just around the corner, in sight, and it's good. Listen to what the author of the Hebrews has written in chapter 11. Faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain 
of what we do not see. Biblical hope not only desires something good for the future, it expects it. It is confident that it will happen. Christian hope is realistic in its expectation for a good future based on the promises of God. William Barclay, in his commentary on 1 Peter, writes, The man that has faith never doubts, even when he cannot see God, he knows that God is standing within the shadows, keeping watch over his own. It is not that God saves us from troubles and sorrows and problems in life, but he enables us to encounter them, to bear them, and to conquer them. End of quote. By definition, depression is a lack of hope. Things cannot and will not ever get better. The loss of hope is a terrible thing. Without hope, life's troubles bring discouragement, depression, despair, even death. We can bear the doctor's diagnosis if there is hope for a cure. We can endure the separation from a loved one if there is hope for a reunion. We can endure certain death with the hope of eternal life and the infinite joy of being in the presence of our God forever. But when there is no hope, we are undone. Just undone. From June the 12th, 1942, until August 1st, 1944, Anne Frank kept a diary. In that diary, she recorded the thoughts and the feelings uh, about the war and her Jewish family's need to hide from Nazi persecution. Their hideaway was a a number of small secret rooms in an Amsterdam warehouse. At night, when everyone else was gone and it was quiet, they could listen to the news on the uh, BBC uh, radio, the broadcast from London. And That is how it was when on June the 6th, 1944, they heard the official announcement, this is D-Day. This is the day it has arrived. The invasion has begun. That night, with guarded enthusiasm, 16-year-old Anne Frank wrote in her diary, is this really the beginning of the long-awaited liberation? The liberation we've all talked about so much. It still seems too good. Too much of a fairy tale to ever come true. Will this year, 1944, bring us victory? We don't know yet, but where there is hope, there is life. It fills us with fresh courage and makes us strong again. End of quote. Hope brings courage. The heroes in the Bible came from all walks of life. Rulers, servants, teachers, doctors, they were male, female, single, married, yet one thing they had in common, and it is that they all built their lives on the promises of God. They lived with hope because God's promised Noah. Noah believed in rain before the word rain was invented. Because God promised Abraham a good home, one he'd never seen, he went. Because God promises Joshua led two million people into enemy territory. Because of God's promises, a giant fell with a stone thrown by a teenage boy. On that first Palm Sunday, when Jesus rode into Jerusalem, the future was filled with hope. Jesus cleansed the temple. He had straightened out his critics. It appeared that nothing was impossible for him to do. And then came his betrayal. The trial, the lies, the beatings, the trumped up charges, the mob that called for his death, one indignity after another, a slap in the face, a crown of thorns, the whip, the agonizing walk to Golgotha. The week began with such great hope, finished in darkness and despair for the disciples. And Jesus breathed his last and was buried Most of the disciples were hiding. Somewhere in Jerusalem, their hope dashed. After the tragic death of Jesus in Jerusalem, there were two disciples who were walking uh, home from Emmaus. You probably remember the story. They were joined by a third individual, 
After listening for a bit, the stranger asked them to share what had happened. This the two travelers did. After they had finished, they had sort of summed up everything this way. They said, we had hoped he was the one to redeem Israel. The words reflect the sadness and sorrow, a loss of hope. Our hope ended when the chief priests and our very own rulers delivered him up to the Romans and had him condemned to death on the cross. We had hoped things would be different. Our hope is gone. The disciples were reflecting this cry of Isaiah. All of our righteousness are like filthy rags, like the wind. Our, our sins sweep us away. How can we be saved? They did not know what you and I know. The third walker was Jesus. They did not know what you and I know. That the reason Jesus gave his life on the cross was to answer Isaiah's question. How can we be saved? Before a holy and righteous judge of the universe. When Jesus died on the cross, the Apostle Paul in his letter to the Corinthians wrote, All our sins... All of our broken commandments were nailed to the cross of Jesus and left there. He then, by his blood, forgave us. And Satan can no longer accuse us, for we have been saved by faith in Jesus. If Jesus remained dead, we are still responsible for our broken commandments and our broken ethics before a holy and righteous creator. By our own efforts, we are helpless to change our eternal destiny. If Jesus is dead, there is no hope. Paul writes, If Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. If Christ had not been raised, your faith is futile and you're still in your sins. For those who have fallen asleep in Christ, they would also be lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people to be most pitied. But the fact is that Jesus Christ has been raised from the dead. He appeared to his disciples and to the two on the road to Emmaus and in the upper room and to more than 500 at one time. He rose from death in the grave and our hope for forgiveness is secure. When Jesus rode into Jerusalem, the disciples had the idea, well, they had no idea what a wild roller coaster ride it was going to be that week. Emotions were high, hope was high, joy, excitement. They were on the edge of political victory. And then came the trial and the cross, and their hope was plunged into a deep and dark valley of grief and fear. And then on Sunday, suddenly they heard the word of hope again from the women. Is it possible? Jesus lives. Well, the Jesus story you and I know did not end at the cross nor at a stone-carved grave. On Sunday morning, there was a violent earthquake. And not only did Jesus come out of the grave, but so did thousands of others, and they saw them, and they went to their families and talked about the resurrection. And that great earthquake is going to come again, and all of us will rise from our graves or will be raptured whenever it happens. We remember the words of the angel to the women who came to the tomb. I know you're looking for Jesus of Nazareth. He's not here. He has risen from the grave. Matthew says the women hurried away from the tomb filled with joy and their hope had been restored. Jesus rose from the dead and appeared to his disciples. He is the first to be given a glorified resurrected body. He's not the last. On judgment day, he's going to bring with him all of our loved ones who have died in faith in Christ. And these people, our family, our friends, our brothers and sisters and mothers and grandparents will not be as we remembered them for they will be given a new glorified resurrected body. Advent is a season of hope. Hope that our Lord is coming again. Hope is based on the knowledge that God created this universe. Hope is based on the fact that he chose to enter this world, which he created through the womb of a virgin girl named Mary. We know it to be true. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here today. Even in a world that laughs, at the impossibility of a God who would choose to live on earth for the purpose of defeating evil. Yes, that's the purpose of defeating Satan who holds people in the grip and the fear of death without hope. 
Have you ever attended a funeral of unbelievers who stand at the grave? It is sad, for they have no hope. Advent is a reminder that Jesus came and he will come again to take us home. And we're building our lives on the promise of God because his word is unbreakable and thus our hope is unshakable. And so we stand on the promises of God just as Noah and Abraham and David and others. May God bless you as you walk through this Advent season preparing for your home for the arrival of Jesus. Amen. Let's join together and sing the next hymn, The Advent of Our King, as we receive the offerings. share our confession of faith together in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in one Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus, and for all people according to their needs. Gracious Lord, Sustain your saints to the end as we enter another church year. Encourage the preachers of your word and all who hear that the testimony about Christ may be confirmed among us as we wait in hope for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, grant your blessing to all marriages and keep all husbands and wives faithful to each other Guide them as they care for children or grandchildren that are entrusted to them. Bestow your loving care upon all children who have suffered difficulty and abuse or neglect, as well as upon all who open their homes to children in foster care. Lord, in your mercy. O oh Lord, guide our nation and its leaders. Protect our armed forces. Take care of them under your care and blessing. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. O oh Lord, deliver the sick from their infirmity, the troubled from their afflictions, the grieving from their sorrow, 
the dying from their fear. We think especially of those listed in our bulletin, including Harold and Pam and Helen and John, Tom, Levita, Winnie, Norma, Beanie, Heather, Barbara, Bennett, Nenglo, Bill, and Stan. May all who cry to you, may they receive grace according to your will. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. And Lord, we lift up to you the family of Steve Morgan and the loss of his father. I pray, Lord, that the peace that passes understanding will guard their hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Give them, Lord, hope in this time. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. O Lord, your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, enter Jerusalem to shouts and cheers of joys as we heard today. Grant that we may be stirred by the word and sacraments to rejoice anew now and at his second coming. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. And gracious Heavenly Father, you have made us glad to enter into your presence, to hear the good news of our Savior and to receive your gifts. Preserve your church against all her enemies. Lead us to walk in your ways and to follow your paths that when Jesus returns in his glory, we may welcome him with shouts of joy. Lord, in your mercy. In your hands, O oh Lord, we commend ourselves, body and souls, in all things. Amen. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Please be seated as we sing the closing hymn.
Amen. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks. Thanks be to God.